basketball player, you're learning different athletic movements than obviously on a baseball field. So taking all those different athletic movements together, it's going to allow you to become a better overall athlete, which is really what colleges are looking to recruit at that next level. Um, so I went down to East Cobb. I'm kind of backtracking and going all over the place. But um, so I got down to East Cobb, played for a summer down there, played with a, a bunch of um, really, really talented ball players. a couple of guys that ended up at BC. Um, I played against Jason Hayward. Um, you guys all should all know Jason Hayward. Um, Justin Smoke, I'm not sure if you are familiar with him, but he pitched for the Mets a couple times or for a couple of years. Um, and just a different level of baseball that was down there. And it was a good experience to see kind of where – I was at on a national level, um, wasn't that good as at a national level in high school, obviously with those guys, but, um, uh, eventually it, it got me back up to, to the Northeast and started to get recruited by Skip Gooley, who was my, my college ball coach and coach Keo's uh, college ball coach. And, um, just the conversations that I had with him, um, and what he wanted and his, his vision for what he wanted of me and the program academically. Um, is kind of what made me make my decision um, to commit over at Quinnipiac. Uh, right before that, I had Manhattan. Um, I looked at Boston College a little bit, looked at UConn, St. John's, all those bigger schools in the Northeast. But um, in order for me to really get onto the field and play and get the most out of my four years, um, Quinnipiac was going to give me the best opportunity to, to do that. So um, yeah, I, I like that a lot because, you know, what, what you're touching on right now, especially with, with the opportunity, a lot of guys, I think nowadays, um, when they're in they're in a club ball setting and stuff like that, I've I've seen. I mean, there's been a few kids that have left our program. You know, we we would have loved to have them stay, um, but I feel like a lot of kids. I know probably I can count them on both hands, uh, ten or twelve kids that over the last two years they've jumped ship and kind of went to a couple different programs, thinking that the grass is greener at the other on the other side and. In, instead of just kind of digging deep and being like, shit, I need to work on this. Let me just focus on my ability, putting my work in, getting myself better and not necessarily where either my friends are going or where certain, certain programs are going on uh, tournament trips, stuff like that. You know, I think, I think some guys, especially with the division one, I, division two, I, depending on the schools, they get this kind of, with the recruiting and Instagram and I, you know, get the post, Oh, Hey, I'm going to, you know, division one here. And they might sit on the field or sit on the bench for two years. You know, it might be okay with that. But like you said, it was, it was for you getting on the field kind of right away. You know, your freshman year, I remember when we went down to Georgia, you got some playing time. You started against Georgia. I think one of the games, um, you know, you got onto the field that freshman year and then bang your sophomore year, the next three years, you were a three-year starter. So, you know, yeah. if you want to touch a little bit more on that, like you were saying, really getting into the nitty-gritty of giving yourself an opportunity to step on the collegiate field, opposed to wasting two years of eligibility and then kind of playing catch-up in the draft or if you wanted to sign as a free agent and kind of take that leap as, as a professional baseball player. Yeah, no, I mean, I think there's a lot to be said, even going back to what you were saying about, you know, guys that are leaving different programs. And obviously, like, you know, people are spending money and you want to have, have a good fit. But I think there's a lot to be said for guys that start with one travel ball program and work their way up. You know, if you start as a 13 year old with one travel ball program, I mean, you're starting with that whole coaching staff at 13. Um, you know, if you think about that, those guys are going to have your back a little bit more when it comes to the recruiting process and finding you the right fit or helping you find the right fit by the time you're 16 and 17, because you spent a couple of years with them and you know what they're all about compared to if you're jumping around from travel ball to travel ball, because you know, this one travel ball team, you know, they get all the guys to division one. Well, it's really nice that they get all the guys to division one, but how many of those guys are sticking to the division one program that they're with yeah. and how loyal are those coaches in those, in those programs that you're going to when you're 17 years old and you've only been there for, you know, three months working out with them. They have their other guys that have been with them for thir for since they were 13 years old. So I think when, it, when, you know, picking and deciding a travel ball program, it, you have to look at, at everything, you know, and a lot of it is the same as when you're looking at coaches or at colleges, you know, what is the coaching staff? You know, do they have experience? Are they going to get me better? Are they going to develop me into a player that can play at the next level? And then, you know, do they have my best interests at heart or are they only looking to try to make sure I can only go to the schools they want me to go to? There's a lot of coaches that have really good um, coaching friends at these universities and they try to push them to different places. Um, and it's not everybody. There's a ton of really good travel ball programs in the Northeast. 
Um, you know, but it's, you, you guys got to kind of filter through that. And I think you're with a really good travel program right now, um, you know, with Coach Keo and what, what he's uh, building up there. But, you know, you have to find that program that is going to do what's best for you or help you do what's best for you. You know, you don't want a, a travel ball coach or anybody telling you where to, where you should go to college. You should ask, they should ask you, what do you want from a university? And I think when you're getting to that next step and you want to get into that, um, looking into universities, the biggest thing I always tell kids is don't go to some place just because of the laundry loop. All right. So what do I mean by that? Just because it says a certain school on their, on their uh, logo and you can go, come back home and you can wear all the gear to your hometown gym or, you know, when you go back to the high school football games or something, don't just go to that school because it's got a cool, um, you know, because it's a cool Nike school and it's a big program. Because if you sit on the bench for four years or you get cut after a year, what, what good was that tweet that, you know, so blessed to say I committed to so-and-so university, yeah. right? So when you're picking that university, you have to look at the entire picture academically, socially. Can you play there? Sure, it's really cool to get recruited as the 35th guy, but what's the point of being on the team if you're the 35th guy, if you're never going to see the field? You know, if, are you going to last there academically? Are you going to last there socially, which is a big component, and a lot of people don't talk about it. If you don't fit in with the, with the culture of the school or the university, you're going to be out of there uh, quicker than you sign your letter of intent. So, you know, culture, um, you know, the social aspect of it, academics, and the ability to actually play at the university that you're going to, um, those are three things that you really have to take a, a look at and, you know, sit down with yourself and your family and say, do these things align with what I want out of my education? Mm -hmm. And then, you know, above all else, um, and I talked to Coach Keo about this uh, last week on the phone, you just have to understand that playing college baseball or college sports at any level, division one, two, or three is a privilege. So not everybody has the right to, after they're done playing high school ball, all right, it's time to go to college. I'm just going to step onto a, a college program. Not, that's not for everybody. It's a privilege to be able to throw a, universe, uh, a jersey on from whatever school you end up at, and whether it's Division One, Two, II, or Three. And if you want to play at the next level after college, baseball is the one sport where you could be at the Division Two or Division Three level, be better than everybody else, and get your opportunity to play pro ball. But um, don't take it, you know, don't look at somebody else's recruiting and say, well, they're going to Division One, so I want to go to Division One. If you can, if you can sign a letter of intent to play at Division Two or go to a division three program and get some ABs, you're way further ahead than a lot of the kids that you're going to be playing high school ball with. For yeah. sure. And, and I think the other night when, when we were on the phone, we were talking about, you know, if you're good, they're going to find, you, you know, if you, if you're playing D three or D D two, you know, um, there's going to, there's some guys on here that are going to have the opportunity to play, um, you know, division one baseball, whether it's maybe their junior year or, you know, who knows their freshman year, some of those guys might be better off going to maybe a D3 top NESCAC school, you know, but you look at, especially you, you know, guys, um, throughout your, your process, guys in the NESCAC schools, whether it's uh, Middlebury, Trinity, I mean, tons of draft picks over the years, you know, they pick that setting because they're going in there as a freshman, they're showcasing themselves for three, four years, and they're still, you know, they're still good, they're still on the market. Uh, Let's see. Yo, I got kicked off. My no, bad. Um, I was just saying, so, you know, those, those guys, like you were saying about the whole, Hey, I get to rock this gear because it's division one, but I'm not going to step on the field till junior year. You're better off going, you know, playing at a, a smaller school or a, a better situation where you're going to go in there and you're going to compete for a starting job, whether it's pitcher, catcher, whatever position it is, then, just sitting on the bench, you know, because what a lot of guys don't realize too is you might, you might go into a school and you're slated maybe to really get time as a junior, right? Well, the next two years until you get your time too, there's more recruits. There's more guys coming in that they're going to try to take your job. So even in your head, you might figure, okay, I have um, maybe a year and then I'm going to get my time or two years and I'm going to get my time. There's new, there's fresh guys coming in every year that, that want that position. So your junior year, when you're slated to start or how things kind of fall into place, might never happen because they might bring in a freshman two years later that say, hey, that's our stud at shortstop. He's coming in as a freshman. He's going to get his time and he's going to battle you and he, he might beat you. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I think the thing is, you know, you're always going to have to constantly work. And just because you are working hard doesn't guarantee you 
a certain amount of playing time because like coach just said, you know, recruiting never stops. I mean, you guys know now you're going through it. You know, kids are getting calls as freshmen and sophomores. Recruiting never stops. So if you can get an opportunity to play at a school that – and the key word there is play at a school that you really – you know, like I said, those three things really align with um, with what you're looking for, that's when you need to jump at those, at those offers or start to take those offers really seriously. And don't ever discount – um, a coach, if he calls you and he says, you know, I'm from so-and-so division three or division two school, don't ever discount him because you don't know what could happen in the next year when he gets a recruiting position at another school. Yeah. And now maybe it's a school that you want to go to, but you didn't really give him the time of day because he wasn't at that, divi- he was at that division two or division three school, yeah. you know? So you always have to remember coaches are moving and shifting around a lot. And especially in the Northeast, it's a very small group of coaches that are very close and they talk all the time. So whether it's the you know big time head one, uh, head coach at Division One in the Northeast or a smaller school Division Three head coach in the Northeast, you have to give them the same amount of respect because you don't know who knows who and who's talking to who. All right. Um, and the other thing is, um, you know, when you're looking at an NE10 or a NESCAC school, those NE10 programs are just as good or close to as good as any of the Division One programs in the Northeast. And you put any of those arms up against any of those bats. You know, a lot of those times those arms could dominate. So just because it doesn't have that Mac logo or the Big East logo or, you know, whatever logo you're looking at, um, you know, there's a lot of really good baseball at all levels in the Northeast, 100%. That's like, I mean, City Series, for instance, you know, when we were at Quinnipiac, you had Quinnipiac, Yale, two Division One schools, Southern Connecticut, NE10, one of the top NE10 teams, and then University of New Haven, which was, I think, also NE10. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Oh, so, through – and then I think two two years or so, and I think they've won it last year. You know, there's those any ten schools, they're Division two schools. They they compete every every fall series. You know, and, and they they take wins against um, Division one programs. They compete. You know, they win the city series. Is no different. Yeah, and they're usually nationally ranked with you know University of Tampa or Franklin Pierce. I mean, Franklin Pierce is you know. So, um, top 10 a lot of the time southern new hampshire's top 10 a lot of the time i mean those schools get kids drafted merrimack merrimack just jumped from any 10 to the nec so yep. um, and like you were saying about all the coaches in the northeast too i mean you you know you got to be polite even if a, a school reaches out to you and you're not um, necessarily interested you know respond thank them for you know reaching out say hey coach thanks for reaching out i really appreciate it i'll you know i'll take a look into the school um, you know, academically, things like that. Don't just kind of ghost them because, you know, you don't want to burn bridges where me and me and Coach Nissen are sitting sitting there hanging out or we're at a, a game or something like that and, and someone's name comes up and I said, oh, you know, I've reached out to him a couple times, you know, I haven't heard from him. You know, kind of that ghost effect thinking like, oh, you know, hey, I'm a, a D3 school or D2 school, but they're kind of blowing me off because they might think that I'm better, you know. Yeah. So, uh, another thing I wanted to touch on too with what you were saying about some kids jumping ship and, and going to some different programs. Does does a college coach or, coach or recruiting coordinator in a, a college setting do they not necessarily weigh heavy on that? But in terms of loyalty, you know, bringing a guy into your program and say, "Hey, if you're going to have to fight as a freshman and you might not win that job or you might not split, you might not be happy, um, are you going to treat this like maybe your travel bar? Are you going to say?" F this, I'm going to transfer to so-and-so because they said I'm going to start, you know. Are you going to jump around or would you look at that loyalty factor as, hey, this guy's jumped around, he could transfer out of my school if I don't give him what he wants right after the bat. Or this guy's been in this one program for four or five years, he's bought in, he's progressed, he's worked hard. That's a guy that I want in my program because he's going to buy into the culture. Even if he doesn't win that starting spot, he's going to work hard. He's still going to try to, you know, get there. Even, you know, there's guys out there not given, but that's the, the new norm of, hey, I'm promising you the world. And if they don't get it, they they transfer out ASAP or they find a, another alternative. Yeah, I mean, I think – now, I don't want to speak for every coach out there because I think a lot of coaches will have their own way of, of looking at that. But for me personally, and, um, you know, I would look at it – one, I would do my homework, right? So if, if a guy is leaving a program, if it's just one time leaving, you know, why did he leave? Why did you leave? You know, why did you leave and, and tell me – um, you know, I need a couple different reasons. Then I would go to that coach of his previous program and say, why do you think he left? Because this is what he told me, and I want to hear what you have to say about it. And then I'd go to his, his new program um, and ask why he, you know, came over to them. But 
Um, I think if it's multiple jumps, you know, two, three, four jumps, then that does question some of the loyalty. It questions some of his motive and exactly what he's trying to get out of, of his travel ball experience is he's just trying to be the man on every single team. And if he's not, he's just going to jump ship. Like you said, you know, cause when you come into a college program as a freshman, you are just that you're a freshman, you're at the bottom of the totem pole and you're going to come in as a 17 or 18 year old kid. And there's going to be a 22 year old old grown man that's been there for four years at third base or shortstop. And you're not going to walk in and just take that position from him. So um, if that is the case and you walk in there and you're not the starting guy, are you just going to bounce on us? Um, you know, for me, it would raise some concerns for sure, um, you know, depending on how, how that player answered and what the feedback was from his previous coach and his current coach. Um, you know, I then I think it's a case to case basis for sure, because some kids, you know, maybe just financially, I just couldn't stay with that program. OK, no problem. Like I get that 100 percent or if, if and you can kind of, you know, as coaches, we try to look through some of the weeds here and, and try to figure out what kids are actually saying, even if they're not telling us. Yeah. And if a kid just says, you know, the coach didn't like me. Well, you know, all right, so the coach didn't like you, so you're just going to leave. Now, what does that mean? Did the coach not like you? Because there's a lot of times where I'm sure some of my players didn't like, thought that I didn't like them, but it wasn't because I didn't like them. It was because I'm pushing them to do the things that I know that they're capable of doing, whether that's academically or athletically. You know, I'm not going to push someone that I don't like to go to class. I want you to go to class so that you can succeed and get a good job and have a family. Yeah. You know, I'm not going to get on your case because you're missing class if I don't like you. Um, so I, I think it's just kind of sifting through the weeds on, on what is actually going on there. But I would say if you're switching more than, you know, one time throughout the course of a three to four year period, then there's going to be some red flags for sure. Yeah. And I mean, there's, there's certain circumstances where some of the bigger, bigger programs out there that, that go to Wilson premier and stuff like that, as you progress through the ranks, Hey, you're, you're really there we're not going to Arizona in the fall or vice versa or something like that. Take the opportunity. Um, yeah. the, the last dance thing that's going on right now. Cool thing that I saw the other night was um, coach Smith at North Carolina. When he told Jordan, he's like, go to the league. Like I'm yeah. not, I, I could be selfish, you know, um, but you know, go, go do your thing. Yeah. Progress, show yourself, you know, get out of here type of thing. I know what was best, best for his guys. Yeah. Um, guys are making millions. So um, we're touching a lot about, you know, in, in terms of recruiting and stuff like that. Let's uh, let's jump back to that in a second. Um, let's go back to your playing days. So as an as an approach in hitting, there's tons of tons of hitting stuff out there right now. Um, different ways to hit different approaches, things like that. Five strikeouts out of one hundred and seventy one at bats. It was that that year. What, what was your approach throughout college and then maybe transitioning into pro ball and then when you were a coach at Quinnipiac and then Fairfield working with some hitters and stuff like that, what was your approach? Did it kind of stick? Is it something that you've, you've kind of kept all along the way? Did you adapt a little bit with how some of the game has changed? Um, and kind of, you know, give us a sense of what you thought as a hitter. You know, was it see ball, hit ball, hard type thing? Were you more worried about, some guys, they get psyched out because they're more worried about those mechanics in game and their slots and stuff that it kind of takes the competitor aspect out. It takes the night coordination and just hit the ball hard approach out. Um, so if you want to elaborate on that, you know, the hitting aspect of the game and kind of what you you did and what you taught at, at the divisional level. Yeah, so um, coming into college, I was, you know, very – like I was not recruited highly at all by any means. Um, you know, I had a couple offers, but um, I never felt um, offensively that I uh, was the best player on the team or that I could like that, that I could always hold, hold my own. So I felt like I always had to work a little bit harder than everybody else to make sure that I wasn't the reason that we were going to lose games. You know, now I'm six foot two, 120 pounds as my, as a freshman in college. And, Coach Keo can show you a picture sometime. There's a picture of me batting against University of Georgia, and I am uh, 5'11". It looks like 135 pounds. I was a stick. Um, and I was never able to have any type of power um, at all. I was more of a line drive, spray the ball, gap to gap type of guy. But um, the biggest thing that I wanted to make sure I did was swing at the pitches that I could hit. And uh, the main reason that I – didn't strike out as much as some other guys is because when I saw a first pitch fastball, if it was in a zone that I can control, I made sure that I put a swing on it. 
and a good swing on it. Because my one of my favorite things I ever heard in hitting is swing hard just in case you hit it. So if I knew that a fastball was coming, if there, if it was a breaking ball first pitch, I took it. My approach was I'm going to swing at the fastball. And I felt that I could work the inner half all the way to the outer half of the plate. And if it was a fastball within the zone, I'm going to put a good swing on it and I'm going to give myself the best chance to uh, put the ball in play and hit the ball hard. Um, now, as I got older and a little bit stronger, that approach became a little bit more defined as in, you know, I'm, today I'm, I'm only going to work on that middle away because I was really good at working middle away. But um, uh, I lost my train of thought. I'm sorry. Um, but I still wanted to attack the fastball. I wasn't just going to try to, um, you know, allow them to beat me with uh, a breaking ball. There. I was going to make sure that I stuck to my approach throughout. Um, as I got bigger and stronger, I was able to open up my swing a little bit more. And as I got more composed as a, as a junior and senior, I opened up from not just a fastball, but if it was a breaking ball that I could see the hook coming out of the pitcher's hand, I'm going to swing and, and attack that first pitch. Um, the biggest thing for me is I stuck to my approach at every single year. Um, I wasn't going to stray from that approach and allow the pitcher to beat me. If I was going to get beat, I was going to get beat my, um, I was going to beat myself. Um, and then going on into uh, pro ball or indie ball for the couple of years, um, that approach had to become even, I had to stick to that approach even more um, because those guys are way better. You know, I was playing in the Can-Am League, which is a, a relatively high indie ball league with some um, guys that I've played in the big league, some guys that are double A, triple A. Um, you know, when I first got to Worcester in uh, the Can-Am League, Jose Canseco was on that team. Um, and then when I got to New Jersey, uh, Angel Barroa, who was a rookie of the year for the Royals, was on that team. So there's a lot of these high-level guys, and I had to make sure that my approach was I was preparing for these high-level pitchers. But again, I had to stick to what I was able to do really well. And what I did really well was I was able to hit a fastball early in the count. Mm -hmm. Now, when you get to that level, guys can sink it, guys can spin it, um, and it's a little bit more difficult. So I had to make sure that I was more prepared than, obviously, when – I was when I was in college, yep. um, you know, moving forward into the coaching ranks, um, my approach kind of, it, it, it evolved every single year. When I first started to coach, I was working with uh, coach Delaney over at Quinnipiac university. He taught me an amazing amount about hitting um, from his background as uh, you know, playing at Quinnipiac and then the Brewers organization. And some of the things that I picked up in my own were just, you know, I didn't ever want to make a cookie cutter hitter. So with my, my hitting philosophy essentially is, is that, I'm not going to take our four hitter who's 6'5", 240 pounds and try to have him hit the same as our leadoff guy who's 5'8", you know, 150 pounds. Um, I'm going to go and I'm going to try to figure out what they do really well and hone in on that. So at um, Quinnipiac, when I was there my last year, um, we had our four hitter who was 6'5", like 260. And he, this kid could hit the ball further than anybody um, that I've ever seen or that I ever saw or ever played with. Um, so his swing, naturally, I'm going to, I'm going to work with him to try to get him a little bit more. I don't want to use the term uphill, but have the launch angle type swing so that he can get the ball in the air because he can miss hit a ball and it can go out. Um, now with our leadoff guys or our smaller guys, I'm not going to have them necessarily go straight up, um, or have a launch, a, a, a launch angle that's going to, uh, have them, um, produce fly ball yeah. um, outs. Yeah. Um, but for me, a hitting approach and hitting philosophy is so fluid because, you know, every year you have um, different, uh, different kids coming into your program, different kids that you're recruiting. I mean, I know a lot of people want to recruit to their, to what their philosophy is, but I want to coach to the kids that I have and try to make them the most successful players that they, that they can be. Um, you know, so I want to take what you guys work really well at, and and try to make sure that you can do that the best that you can um, for me is aggressiveness at the plate so that's how I was as a player that's how I I that's the main thing that I teach philosophy wise um as a hit as a hitting coach is aggressiveness at the plate if you're going to just sit back and allow them to beat you with flat fastballs in out then they're just going to play with you with their breaking stuff but if you can jump in that box and show that pitcher that you're going to be aggressive on that first pitch even if you foul off a first pitch fastball He's, he's going to think twice about throwing that again. And then he's got to try to play with you a little bit and his zone gets expanded. So the biggest thing I would say from my philosophy is just being aggressive in the zone. When I was at Fairfield University um, the last couple of years, we tracked how many fastballs they took in a first pitch counts. 
And then that equated that to what their average was. And you could see a direct correlation to, all right, this is why, you know, their average is a little bit lower and they're taking these first pitch fastballs, you know, over and over and over. Um, you know, it's, you can see the big difference of probably, the kids. That probably are, falling behind in counts, stuff like that going, oh, one now it becomes a mental game of, is he going to throw me that change up curveball in the dirt, whatever it is. You know, that, yeah, that absolutely. Psyche thing. Then, you know, it, it gets you out of that comfort zone. If you start, you know, playing away from maybe your strength, you know, it's, it starts kind of psyching you out because now it's, it's too many things to worry about that second, third pick. Right. Um, I think we got, I think we only have about five more minutes because we, I think we have a limit because we got a bunch of people in here. So I think we were only 40 minutes, but if you want to talk about uh, when you were coaching at Quinnipiac and, and Fairfield, a lot of these guys are high school guys. They're going to be up at NEBC. They're going to be in showcases. They're going to be in tournaments uh, this, this summer, kind of trying to impress a lot of college guys, get themselves on the map, starting the recruiting process. We only have one guy. He's a junior right now. He's the oldest. We have no, you know, no other real juniors. A lot of, a lot of sophomores that are, are in the pipeline. Our junior Xander, he's, he's a hell of a pitcher. He's you know, getting looked at by a bunch of different schools. So if you can just touch on kind of what what you were looking at when you were at NEBC um, and kind of what you were looking at in a recruit, both on the field and off the field for a couple minutes, just so we don't get closed out, but um, kind of refresh them of yeah on the field and, you know, the, the academic part too, you know? Yeah. So, I mean, the first thing, if there's a kid that I'm really interested in, I'm obviously, I'm going to go in and try to get there early and watch their actions with their teammates. How do they treat their teammates? How do they treat their parents? How do they treat their coaches? Um, Cause what you are, how you're treating those three people, it says a lot about who you are as a person. Um, I'm going to talk to your coach. If that's coach Q, I'm going to say, you know, what kind of, what kind of student is he? How are his academics? If this, if he says his grades aren't that great, I'm going to move on to the next guy because we don't have enough time to try to get, you know, your grades up, especially if you're at a junior when there's other kids with the same ability, but those grades are going to be able to help them get into school and help with that scholarship money. Um, and then, the, and then obviously the important component is, can you play? Um, but al along all that, I'm going to do a lot of research into you. I'm going to talk to your coaches. I'm going to watch you play a couple of times and see how you, how you do play. I almost sometimes want to see a kid fail just to see how they react. If you strike out in a big situation, um, you know, and with all these tournaments, there's a ton of eyes on you guys at the NEB complex, but you guys need to make sure that when you go off site and you're 40 minutes away from the NEB complex and you don't think there's any colleges there, you're playing with the same energy and passion that you're playing with at the complex. Because I can tell you that there's been multiple times when I've gone and other coaches that I know have driven that 40 minutes or 20 minutes, whatever it is off site, because they want to see a pitcher on the other team. And then you, you catch the eye of that coach that's there to see the other pitcher because you were stroking the ball really hard that day. You were able to um, play with that same passion as if there were 25 coaches watching you um, and not just, you know, shutting it off, having that on off switch. And you, it was off because you weren't at the, the complex. You were saving it. Cause I can tell you when I know it gets hot out there and you play three games in a day and it's 90 degrees on the turf. Um, but when you're playing a 56 game schedule in 65 days in college and you're pra you've been practicing since September of that year, you know, yeah, your body's going to break down and you're going to get tired, but it's those kids that can put together that passion, that energy um, at the end of a tournament or the end of the summer and continue to play like it's inning one when it's really inning 27 for them. You know, that's the kid that I want to try to re recruit because I know he's going to bring it every single day. Because when you get to college, you're going to have to bring it every single day. Because when you first walk on um, to that field as a freshman, and you're, like I said before, you're that 18 year old kid. All right. And nothing's guaranteed. If you don't bring it every single day, those everybody's going to pass you. And then you're going to be sitting there at the end of the bench. Like where, where did this go wrong? And it started because in high school, you weren't bringing it every single day and July 15th in your third game, because you were tired. It's one thing to be tired. I can tell when kids get tired, but you can also see the mentality of kids um, that really want to be out there and really want to play and get to the next level and work hard for their team. Yeah. I, I think that's great too. The, the mental aspect, because that is, you can, a lot of guys out there, you can teach the physical attributes, you know, you can get in the cage, you can get on the mound, you can, you can work on pitch grips, you can work on swing paths, stuff like that. You can work on fielding. The, the mental intangibles is, is the stuff that sometimes you can't, you know, really teach. And that's, that's the thing uh, that's going to 
maybe get you an opportunity in college. Say, hey, this guy's a good ball player, but he busts his ass, he rallies his team, everyone kind of – he might not be the number one player, but he's always in it, you know, kind of that Pedroia mentality almost where, okay, he might not be my starting shortstop right now, but he's going to get a chance, and his just hard work and grit is going to wear off on other guys on my team, and it's going to kind of create that – that culture or keep that culture that we want as a, as a collegiate program. Yeah. You don't have to have Michael Jordan's ability to have Michael Jordan's work ethic. Yeah. You know, and, and there's that old saying where it's hard work beats talent when talent doesn't work hard, you know, people think it's so cliche, but it's, it's proven at, at so many levels, um, especially with some of the greats, you know, your Tom Brady's your Jordan. So even those examples right there are, are just some great ones. So. So I think uh, I think we got just popped up. We got less than one minute. So, right. um, fellas, thanks, uh, thanks, Coach Nissen. Thanks, Coach. Uh, huge, thanks for huge, huge. I appreciate it. Hopefully, uh, uh, learned a little Coach. something. Thank you, Coach. Yeah. Thank you, Coach. Great stuff recruiting wise. So I appreciate it, Kyle. So uh, I'll you, give Coach. you a call tomorrow, and we'll catch up, and we'll we'll review some stuff. I have this recording, so I'll post it so I can send it to uh, to all my guys too. So uh, yeah, but I appreciate it, man. Good. All right, appreciate it, Kyle. I'll talk to you guys later. All right, stay safe out there. Somebody, somebody put this is basically a, a, a 